uh, we are uh, getting ready to for our last session of the day in the Aim Across the Lifespan series. Uh, today, we have talked about early childhood. We have talked about uh, libraries and transition to whatever post-secondary looks like. And now we're moving to a topic that's just a little bit different, but just as crucial. We are talking about um, uh, aim for administrators and the administrator role. We all have a role in the provision and being part of a system to make sure that our kids have the tools that they need. So the recordings are being archived in the Accessible Educational uh, Materials Group within our OER Commons, uh, the Oregon Open Learning Hub. You'll find the resources there. Uh, handouts for today for all of the sessions are in a single location. Uh, for you to access. And uh, Gail Bowser is part of our leadership team for the Oregon AIM cohort, very involved on so many levels in the work here in Oregon, and has a bigger picture view because she's doing similar work across the country. Uh, just these topics just keep coming back around, don't they, Gail? Uh, if you're not an AIM evangelist yet, you will be uh, by the time we, uh, we talk about all of the ins and outs of providing AIM. Gail, I'm going to let you talk more about yourself because if I were to present a bio, uh, it would be several inches thick and I couldn't get through it. So I'm just going to let oh. you introduce yourself. Go ahead and start sharing uh, your uh, presentation and tell us what we need to be sharing with our administrators. You know, uh, my favorite introduction ever, I, I have done a fair amount of uh, public speaking in my career and my favorite introduction ever was um, a woman who introduced me to a group of about 300 people. And she said, if, if there's one thing you need to know about Gail is that it is that she is a teacher. So um, I'm a teacher by training. There's not much I can do to overcome that barrier. Um, and I love sharing big ideas and um, the things that um, I think that we can talk about and have discussions about. So I was thrilled when Deb uh, asked me to do this particular topic at the end of the day today, because I think hopefully it will bring together um, a lot of ideas that you've heard throughout the day. I know I've had the chance to watch several of the today's presentations and that each one of them, there was at least one or two good ideas that I really wanted to take back to either my own work or people that I'm working with um, in the field of uh, AIM and assistive technology. But one of the things that we really, really know is that when we have those individual good ideas, they, they often will help us go back and work with an individual child or a classroom where we're, where we're having, um, you know, some success or something like that. But in order to really make systemic change, we need administrators on board. So, the focus of today's session is about how do we talk to administrators, to our principals, to our directors of special ed, even to our school superintendents about accessible educational materials and the things that our agencies need to do in order to make them more available and, and systemically um, an option for all of our students who might need them. A lot of the ideas that we tend to talk about because they're very fun and very um, useful are focused on individual students. We see the progress that individual kids make and um, we get very excited about that. It warms our heart. Sometimes it make, bring, brings tears to our eyes. But when if what we're talking about is trying to create that experience for all of the kids whom we serve in our district or in, in, in the agency where we're providing um, assistive technology and accessible materials, then we need administrators on board. So 
If you're not a principal or a school administrator or a director of special ed of, of some sort, or if you're not a person who's like a curriculum director, a district office person, for today, I want you to pretend that you are, because we're going to talk about um, AIM and the, and the ins and outs of creating a systemic accessible educational materials um, system. So that will be our focus. So just pick pick a role and pretend who you are today. Um, here's my bio and a way to get in touch with me if you want that. Um, I want to disclose that um, I'm author on several different books, but the one I'm proudest of these days is called Leading the Way to Excellence in Assistive Technology Services a guide for school administrators. So uh, with my friend Penny Reed, we, I, we started this work in thinking about what do administrators need to know in, in order for us to make systemic changes. And um, that has led to using a lot of those ideas in today's presentation, which is very specific to AIM. Um, our learning outcomes will be able to define aim and describe some of the laws relating to accessibility and curriculum from an administrator's point of view. I think all of these should have at the end of it from an administrator's point of view, because that's really the focus that we're taking today. Um, we'll be able to identify some actions that we'd like to see our agency take that our director of special ed or our principal or somebody like that might be able to take um, in order to make our instructional materials and our educational materials more accessible. And we'll give you some resources for places where you can find out more information of, about um, some of the topics that we'll cover briefly today. Um, one of those you've heard a bunch about uh, as we've gone through the day and done the different sessions. And that is the OER Commons, which we're hoping will be the hub for the AIM cohort work that we've been doing. I know you've heard already today, if you've been in another session, that the AIM cohort is a group of Oregon educators all the way from early childhood to higher education and workforce um, and parent engagement who are interested in making uh, instructional materials and I think also information materials more accessible to anybody who needs accessibility features, um, whether they be young children or um, elderly people who are losing um, some of their things that they used to be able to do. So we're trying to develop a coordinated statewide system and that starts with having a coordinated local system for either your LEA or um, your education service district or your community college, whatever agency you represent. We wanted to acknowledge that we are affiliated with the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials and just make sure that you know that we're one of quite a number of states now that work with the AIM Center. Um, to investigate what are systems that do a good job of providing accessibility look like and how can we create those uh, in other places where the systems may not be as, as effective. So we are proud of our connection with the AIM Center and we look forward to another year of that in the, in the grant that we're part of. So, Here's where we start to talk about um, things that administrators may look at a little bit differently and may ask more intensive questions about. Um, the definition, what are accessible educational materials on this slide is actually from a footnote. You'll notice here it says footnote number 10 in a document um, that was published by the um, Office of Special Education Programs, and it defines accessible educational materials as print and technology-based educational materials, including printed 
and electronic textbooks and related core materials um, that are used by all students um, in to be more accessible. I don't want to read you the whole definition, but I do want you to have it because if you'll see the footnote to this footnote says that in ITEA since 2004, the term has been accessible instructional materials. So it's AIM, A-I-M, rather than AIM, A-E-M. If you have administrators who are very concerned about following the exact wording in our current law, it's important for you to know that the current law is IDEA 2004, and it really still talks about AIM, A-I-M, accessible instructional materials. The reason that's important is that the original AIM only talked about four specialized formats. It talked about digital text, large print, braille, and audio. In this new definition, which has been approved by the Federal Office of Special Education Programs, we are talking about uh, accessible media written and published electronic textbooks and related core materials that are required by education agencies for use by all students. So we've branched out from only books, only print materials to any ex educational material and the, uh, the idea of access to that material. I really, um, I, I do get to talk to groups of administrators fairly often. And one of the things they'll say to me is AEM isn't what the law says. Why is that different? So if you have a savvy administrator like that, it's really important for you to be able to say that there has been a change. It has been improved by OSEP and the AEM part of the um is part of the mix now. So all in educational materials. I think if you watch some of our sessions today, you may have seen this definition a couple of times. It's a definition of accessibility. And it means a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability equally as effective and e in a timely manner. So what does that look like? If I just give this definition to my uh, elementary school principal, she's probably likely to say, well, how does that apply to our school? How does it apply to the actual things we're doing? So um, what I'd like to do is, um, switch to a video. Let's watch a video for just a couple minutes. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's kind of long. Um oh and a bit I'm gonna I'm sorry I forgot to when I signed on the second time I forgot to turn on the sound. So let me do that and uh then we'll watch this video together. Here we go. This is AIM in the 21st Century Classroom. It is on the CAST website. We talked earlier about being partners with CAST. So let's watch a bit of this. Stars Mill High School and the Fayette County Public Schools in Georgia are working to establish 21st century classrooms to integrate technology into curriculum, instruction, and assessment to support the participation and achievement of all students. By integrating accessible instructional materials and accessible technology in the classrooms for all students, students with disabilities benefit from the flexibility and supports provided and often need only limited or no other accommodations. They recognize that print textbooks represent a fixed medium, one size fits all, which is not accessible to many students with disabilities. To meet the needs of all students, content is provided in flexible digital media, which is available via technology and can be adjusted as needed. To ensure the provision of accessible materials, Georgia law requires that publishers of recommended learning resources or textbooks provide an electronic version of each student edition. Audrey Tony, the principal of Stars Mill High School, like other principals, sets the tone for the staff and student body. 
So I wanted to stop real quickly and just point out to you that this is a video about a Georgia school, um, but the ideas and the laws that are talked about in this video also apply to Oregon. I just want to make sure we were clear about that. She describes how they work to make sure that accessibility for students with print disabilities is considered in the textbook procurement process. Every time we have a adoption in place, the teachers that are on the committees, the coordinators and so forth that are on the committees, they're going to always look to see what else does that company bring before we make that adoption. If the company, of course, at this point only have a hard copy, chances are we're not going to adopt that series. Our exceptional children services are always part of those adoption processes, so they are able to also tell the teachers and the companies of their needs as well. There are two key elements of accessibility that must be in place, accessible content and accessible technology. The assistive technology specialist describes some of the technology included in the 21st century classroom. So each classroom has a projector, it has a smart board or a screen. There is a way for the teachers to save their lessons through Edmodo, which is an online sharing. We have portable tablets that also have software that records. So anything the teacher projects can be recorded and then uploaded for students review later. In the Fayette. So I'm gonna stop here. You can see we're just about halfway through this video. Let's come back to the PowerPoint, but a couple of things I wanted to point out here. First of all, in this video, one of the things I loved was that you have a principal who can explain the basic concept of accessibility on this video. She knows that their curriculum people look for accessible features in their um, in their uh, curriculum adoption activities. And she knows how those features fit into her classroom instruction. This is also a principal who has allocated budget to make sure that every classroom has a certain set of equipment that makes the classroom and the educational materials more accessible to, um, to the people, uh, to the students with disabilities in her classroom. And, and you heard from the very beginning that in this school, the focus is we're gonna keep as many kids in the regular classroom environment in the inclusive environment as we possibly can. And that's really our focus. So um, this is a video you might want to show to to an administrator that you're um, talking to about AIM. And as, since you're all pretending to be a particular administrator today, you might want to share this kind of a video with all the teachers in your school too, if that's um, if that's become your focus. There, there are laws pertaining to the provision of AIM, and I know that in the first session in our conference today, um, Deborah Fitzgibbons in her early childhood presentation talked about some of those laws. I want to go over again uh, just a few of those items with an eye to why do administrators need to know about these laws? They don't need to know the specific words, but why do they need to know about these laws? And this is actually one of my favorite um, legal uh, aspects of this presentation. This is a joint letter from the Office of Civil Rights uh, of the US Department of Education uh, and the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. So a joint letter. Please note the date. And, and then let me tell you a story about how this letter happened. Basically, what this letter said was that if you're requiring technology in a classroom environment where the technology is inaccessible to a population of individuals with disabilities, that is discrimination, and it's prohibited by all kinds of laws. Um, this is the place where the term um, equally effective and equally integrated manner began to be used. I think it's the first place that it showed up. But what I want to ask if, uh, if anybody knows 
And if you do, you can type it in the chat, is what happened in 2010 that caused this particular letter to be written? So I'm going to wait just a minute and see if there's a, a chat. Uh, okay, well, given the amount of time we have, I'm going to um, just tell you that 2010 was the year of the iPad. 2010 was the year the iPad was issued. And in more than one college and university, the iPads were adopted as a required device for everybody who attended that college and university. And the problem was that there were no, there were no uh, vision accessibility features on the iPad in 2010 when it first came out. It didn't even have a camera, the very first version of the iPad. So a new technology like the iPad or like artificial intelligence um, that we're running into you know, many, many questions about right now can really raise questions of equal access to um, educational materials. Um, and so th this was the beginning of some of our accessibility uh, issues and ideas. The next law, there we go, uh, that I want to talk about um, is uh, the, the uh, NIMAS Act. NIMAS is a vehicle for providing um, in accessible instructional materials. It's the National, oh God, Na National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard. It's NIMAS. And um, some of our laws have created a, a way for school districts to get files, uh, electronic files of educational materials for free, and NIMAS is the vehicle for which that is used. In Oregon, the law, here's the exact wording from the law. It says that school districts must ensure timely provision of print instructional materials, including textbooks that comply with that NIMAS standard for students who are blind or print disabled in accordance with the OAR, and it gives you the number there. It also says, though, that school districts must ensure timely provision of instructional materials in accessible formats to children who need instructional materials in accessible formats, including those who are blind and print disabled. So two important things here. One is the definition of timely manner. And in Oregon, timely manner is defined as at the same time as kids who are not disabled receive their instructional materials. If you've ever worked with kids who have vision impairments and need braille books or, or large print books, you'll know that that is sometimes a very difficult standard to provide um, and to meet. So that, um, but that is Oregon statute and uh, important for for administrators to understand that we can't say in an IEP meeting, oh, we'll have for that textbook for you in October. Everybody else got it last week. Um, so again, timely manner is an important part of our of, of our system. Our education agencies, every education agency in Oregon, this is an Oregon statute again, uh, says that either we have to, as a school district, adopt the uh, accessibility standards of the NIMAS or separately assure that all instructional materials are provided in a timely manner to blind persons or others with print disabilities. So again, that timely manner thing, we can't wait for it. We have to have things ready when school starts, at least by law. Um, so those are the, some of the big picture concepts behind the requirement to be accessible. The way that plays out in Oregon actual um, practice and in rules is that our Oregon IEP has uh, 
has a requirement that we consider not only assistive technology, does the student need assistive technology here is F um, on this list of special considerations, but also does the student need one or more specialized formats, print or digital? And we can talk a lot about the ins and outs of that and how it's in how it has to be written into an IEP and which IEP program you're using. But the basic question is, does your school district system address a student's need for accessible educational materials? Because it is a requirement under the statute. So here is uh, in bigger print, um, the same wording that factor G that you saw in the previous slide, here's the Oregon ruling. And um, one of the things I wanted to point out is there's been some confusion about the wording here because it says blindness or other disability. And it's, it's a common misconception that this really only applies to students who have blindness and not to students who have other disabilities. But in fact, the AIM requirement is for any student who needs access and accessible formats for their educational materials must be provided that. So that's another thing that we hope um, your administrators understand, as particularly as you look at curriculum adoption and things like that. Um, there's a couple Laws that I want to just cover briefly in terms of pertaining to the acquisition of AIM. So we're talking about curriculum adoption. Here's one of the Oregon standards. Um, oh, yeah, one of the Oregon standards. I had to check and make sure it was Oregon or federal because there are standards in both in both um, places. So as a part of any print instructional materials adoption process, procurement contract, or other practice or in instrument used for purchase of print instructional materials, anytime you're purchasing print instructional materials, the Department of Education has to say to the publisher, and yes, we also want a, a digital file that's sent to uh, the, NIMAS, the NIMAC center, the center that collects the files, the electronic files, so that our kids who aren't able to take advantage of print materials are able to have an electronic and more accessible version. Um, another thing that I think it's important for administrators to understand is that when we're adopting curriculum, whether we get electronic files from the publisher through a, a center like the NIMAC, NIMAC Center, or uh, whether we're creating them ourselves or whatever it is, we must have sufficient quantities of those things in alternative formats um, and available in a timely manner to our students. So basically there's a lot of laws that are saying the what amounts to all kids need access to their educational materials, whether it's a first grade workbook or a high school uh, advanced algebra curriculum. Um, everybody needs access to their educational materials and in a timely manner. Those are the things that I think it's really important for your school administrators to understand uh, I gave you all the laws and the citations because sometimes administrators want to know, well, where does it say that in the law or something like that? But basically those basic ideas in a timely manner, all materials accessible for all students are the requirements that we're working under. And this is a list on this slide of possible sources for accessible materials. Um, I know that we can talk about those in another session, but let's talk more about what administrators um, can do to support the development of an agency-wide system that in 
encourages following these rules and also encourages access for our students with disabilities. I strongly believe that support for accessible educational materials begins with a culture of accessibility and inclusion, and that administrators who are aware of processes involving training, assessing learners, selecting curriculum, all those processes that we do in the district, when they have in their head, is this gonna be accessible? This thing we're doing, this training we're doing, this curriculum we're purchasing, we're gonna have better, more, um, more useful and, and more fluid systems for accessible educational materials. So I mentioned to you earlier that, uh, um, that one of the publications that I've been a part of is the Leading the Way to Excellence book. Um, uh, from CAS Publishing. And one of the things that we based that publication on was um, a research study by Leithwood Harrison Hopkins in 2008 that looked up at what are the things that successful school leaders do um, in their basic leadership practices. Not, to, not how do they do the individual things, but what are the things that they do. Um, and the, the, the study ended up dividing things into four categories. First of all, they build a vision and set direction. So you can imagine that um, having a vision that everything in our school is going to be accessible to all students who, in whatever ways they need the accessibility, is a vision that um, might change the way you do some of the things in your school. A successful school leaders also manage the program. They tell their, their staff and the people around them how, to, how we do things in our district. And you know that if you're from a large district, the answer to those questions will be much different than if you're from a, a, a very tiny district with only three or four schools. School leaders also understand and develop individuals. They do super, uh, staff development and supervision, and they make sure that the people they supervise are uh, aware of whatever issue we're talking about. In this case, that they're aware of the need for all students to have access to their educational materials. And then the fourth thing that school leaders do is redesign the organization. They, on a regular basis, they look at what they're doing. They're saying what parts of this are working and what parts of this um, still need to uh, be moved forward. So those are the four categories. What I wanna do today is we, we can give you some more examples on this slide of things that only school administrators can do. So school administrators can ensure that AIM services are legal and ethical. That's why I went through all that law stuff with you because only an administrator can say, you know, we really have a requirement to do this in our district and here's how we're gonna do it. Only school administrators can ensure that appropriate employees know how to respond to a request for AIM. What, what would you do if a parent came to you and said, I think my child needs an alternate format of the, the science textbook this year because you just can't read it. How would staff respond? And only a school administrator can set that tone. Now, of course, you're going to work with other people. But as a principal or as a director of special ed, you need to be able to have an answer for questions like this. And you need to be able to make sure that it's consistently applied throughout the district. Only school administrators can require that we use data to make AIM and AIM <laughs> and AT decisions. Sorry, that's a typo. I always find at least one in the middle of the presentation. Only school administrators can do budgeting. Only school administrators can monitor their services 
take data and see how things, you know, set goals and make sure that the district is improving the goals. And there are a number of frequently asked questions that really have to be answered at the district level. So for the rest of our time today, we're gonna to focus on this management as aspect. One of the things that um, we see a lot is that when, when we begin to wanna to develop a, a district-wide system for AIM or any uh, assistive technology, any aspect of how we do um, technology for kids with disabilities, there are a lot of questions that come up about how do we do things? And one of the best ways to answer some of those questions is to develop written operating guidelines. So that's the management aspect of a school administrator's job. We can have a great vision, but unless we get down to the nuts and bolts of how do we do things and and uh, answer some of those questions, we we might just have a vision that that uh, doesn't really go any place. So we're gonna hope that our operating guidelines ensure that our, our services, our AIM services are responsive to the schools, to parents and students and educators, and also ensure that they're cost-effective and efficient so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time we run across a new question um, and having to do the same thing over and over again, maybe without so many successful results. Um, one of, some of the things we know about guidelines for AIM or any other aspect of school uh, management is that if you don't have a process, it's more, there's more likely to be disagreement and conflict. And it doesn't have to be a separate or complicated process, but you need some kind of process. People need to know what to do when particular things happen. And the more you can put that into uh, frequently asked questions, and the more you can address those questions that are frequently asked, then the more time and energy and resources you have to address the unusual situations and um, situations where we don't have good solid answers because they just don't happen very often. Another thing we know is that if you ask the wrong question, you're bound to get the wrong answer. And the one of the wrong question examples I love to use for this is the uh, the question of, well, what aim do kids with autism need? You know, uh, what accessible materials do kids with uh, with autism or phys physical orthopedic impairments need? Um, that the question is, what are the characteristics of the student and what are the features? of the uh, aim that they may need, what formats might they need, and what are the features of those formats. Um, we have more lessons to be learned, and that is that early involvement of all team members ensures better follow through. So the, the more you can get classroom staff and individuals who are gonna be implementing on a daily basis, involved in an early on in an assessment or in the development of district level processes, the more likely you are to have buy-in and follow through. We know that at least part of any assessment should be done in the customary environment where, where the aim will be used. Um, and we also know that there are an awful lot of aim decisions that could be made by the classroom staff who serve the student on a regular basis. So sometimes we need experts, but not always. Um, I've developed a list of the top 10 questions that I hear um, people asking of their administrators. And I wanna present that today to those of you who are either already um, district administrators or who are pretending today for a while that you do have that administrative responsibility. Um, because I think that these are the questions that can help you as you begin to develop a system 
for um for aim in your agency and please if you have additional questions to the one that that we're going to cover in the powerpoint slides today put them in the chat and we'll address them at the end of the session or if we don't get to them um we'll contact you as and um have a conversation with you about them so here's my top 10 questions the ones i hear most often what should educators do if they believe a child needs aim so basically what are your pre-referral strategies what data should they be collecting what formal processes do they use when they're doing an assessment for of the need for a student who might need accessible educational materials that's going to be a different answer for every district um so but it's one that you need to answer so that people don't know what to do when they when they have that idea. What should educators do if a parent asks for AIM for their child during an IEP meeting? Um, so do you fill out a form? How do you handle that request? In your, it'll be different in your district depending on the request the parent makes and also um, the kind of aim that the student might need. But what we know is that if your staff can't answer that question, we're more likely to have um, some conflict and some disagreement. And what, what we never want is for parents to go away feeling like, well, I asked that question and they didn't have an answer for me, so they don't really care about my request. Our main goal in, in an IEP meeting is to have a conversation with parents so that we know that we are responsive to their concerns and they understand the specialized program that we're developing. Again, a similar question, but what should educators do when a parent asks about AIM during an informal conversation, just in the hallway or when they come to pick up their kids at school? At what point do we document that request and make sure that, again, parents aren't walking away saying, well, I tried to talk to them about that, but they just didn't listen? How and when are our district's AIM assessments completed? So what's the process? When is an AIM evaluation needed, or can we just try things in the classroom? Um, and see if they'll work and then put it on the IEP? Do we need a formal assessment? What are the district's resources to help with AIM? You've heard a lot today during the day about the OTEP uh, loan library, but we also know that your all of your districts um, have accessibility features in the technology that your students are using. Many of your districts have one-to-one -one student devices going on and and what are the resources in those to help with accessible educational materials? If an educator and IEP team is considering recommending a particular kind of aim for a child, how and when should supervisors be notified? This tends to lean toward <laughs> requests for uncommon um, assistive technology or, or devices and also for um, braille solutions. So sometimes it's about cost. Uh, sometimes it's about complicated processes for getting the aim. But administrators need to tell their staff, well, if you're going to purchase any, if you're going to ask for a purchase of something that's $500 or more, <laughs> I want to know about it uh, ahead of time. Um, how do IEP teams consistently consider AIM needs? What's your consideration process? Excuse me, in your district? And when an IEP team does consider AIM, what data should they be using in order to make a decision? Is it changes in student performance? It is... Um, what it do you require a trial period things like that 
How should it be written into an IEP? Where do you write it? And, and what words do you use when you're talking about accessible educational materials? And finally, if there is disagreement or conflict about AIM at any point, what should educators do? At what point should they notify an administrator about that disagreement or conflict? So this is just a list of questions. I'm hoping that what you can do with this list is to um, is to use it as a guide <laughs> as you are having conversations with your uh, agency administrators, with your curriculum directors, with your directors of special ed about how to handle accessible educational materials in your agency. We know that the answers to these questions have to be customized, and we'd be very happy to talk with you more about any one of these questions or um, any other aspect of systemic approaches to accessible educational materials. One of the things that uh, Deb has asked me to talk about is to let you know that um, we do have a technology inventory available um, for your for districts to complete um, that could help you take a look at what what you already have in your toolbox and that may help you make some decisions about where you need to go next. And then on this final slide, we have a bunch of different resources about AIM and materials adoption in Oregon that we wanted to share with you. These are all hot links when you download the um, the slide deck and they will, many of them will lead you to the OER comments that we've talked about quite a lot today. So um, again, I want to invite you, if you want more information, you can feel free to contact me at the email address on this slide. And Deborah Fitzgibbons is an amazingly responsive uh, coordinator for the Oregon Technology Access Program. And I know that she would be happy to talk to you too. So I used my time. Um, I'm happy to take more questions or Deb, how would you like to proceed? Well, I have been looking at the chat box and people are enthralled with the conversation, but maybe they're still preparing the questions they have in their mind. And so uh, you, the time is never gone for questions. You have Gail's information here in mind, but we'll be quiet for just a moment and uh, give you an opportunity to ask any of those questions that may be lingering. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, um, Gail. I really, really appreciated the the questions that administrators need to ask to create their policies. I think that that's great, and and I wish that um, I know me as a parent of a child with an IEP. Um, I would have liked to have been a little more aware of those sorts of things. So thank you for those questions. Those are great. Well, you're welcome. You know, the truth is, I think that kind of set of questions can apply to anything that school administrators are in charge of. Um, could be about bus transportation as, as much as accessible educational materials. But one of the things that really got me going on this topic early on was that I heard special education directors or principals or other administrators say to me, oh, well, I don't worry about that because we have a team. You know, we have an assistive technology team. We have a, a group of people who take care of that for me. And I, I really think that on a one kid at a time basis, those teams are crucial, they're very valuable and they change lives. But when we're talking about having systems that are responsive to parents and to, to kids with disabilities and, and to the needs that are 
imposed on us uh, and required by law, administrators have to get involved. And I, so I think that um, rather than <laughs> rather than wait for um, somebody to fire, file a due process complaint or have a process, uh, because they don't have a process, um, we're better off to ask them those questions up front so that everybody knows what to do in a district. And that really answers the question, where do I start, right? Yeah. Because so many people have that question and they're like, ah, uh, this is a big deal. You know, it's a yeah. big system-wide thing. How do I begin this process? And so this is fantastic. You know, the whole time I was talking, I was, I kind of, in the back of my head, every time I changed the slide, I'd, I was saying to myself, I'll bet Deb thinks I should say more about that. Or there's some details in there that I should say more about that. So this was there just a set of questions <laughs> to get you started. Because <laughs> there are always a lot of details. And we want to invite everybody um, who's on this call or watches this video later to... Um, to investigate what the answers are for your district, but also to contact us if you want more information. Excellent. You know, Gail, every time we do a training, uh, whether it's for therapists or OT, AT, and people go, okay, that's fine that I know this, but what about my administrators? They need to be on board. And if they're not supporting it, or if they're unaware of what's happening, uh, it's as good as not having support because they can't speak to it. Um, and so giving those questions is invaluable. I agree with you, Chandra, on, on that. What about our administrators? We have to bring them into the conversations. And well, I, we have to, go ahead. I think we have to bring them into the conversation in different ways. We, I don't want an administrator to know all the different options for uh, text to speech or speech to text. I don't, they don't need to know that, but they do need to know the processes for their district. Because um, they can come ask me about the options for text to speech. That's right. What is their role? What is the slice of the pie that they control? And exactly. as you said, there are a lot of things that only the administrator uh, can be tuned into. 